Hi, it's Andrea, and I'm back again to talk about HIT 210. We're on chapter 16 and 17 in our book. And this is really about the end of the revenue cycle. Um, now, I've, we've talked a little bit about revenue cycle management and that it starts in the registration um, format or even in pre-authorization and pre-registration goes on through the actual service and into coding and billing, which we're gonna come back to coding, um, hopefully starting next week. I'm not sure yet whether we're gonna start with ICD-10 or CPT-4, but we will get started with coding next week. So brace yourself. I'm gonna try um, recording on Screencast-O-Matic and have um, some coding information up so that you can follow along with me um, or you can do it yourself afterwards and we can work through it. So just some things to think about. <clears throat> so looking at page 363, 363 in your book, um, revenue cycle management says it's the process that healthcare organizations and doctor's offices use to track services provided, patient care episodes from registration and scheduling all the way to the final payment and making sure everything is adjusted accordingly and that crediting is due, crediting is taken care of if something needs to be um, sent back to the government or to another payer or to the patient so that everything is even. It's that whole process <laughs> and it typically involves quite a few people. And so usually you'll hear, hear it referred to as the revenue cycle team because people work together as a team to make it happen. You can't do it by yourself. Definitely not one person. Even in a small office, it takes multiple people and multiple situations to, to um, resolve this. And make sure the money keeps flowing because right now, as we all know, um, it's, it's a bit crazy with our time that um, people aren't in each other's presence and it makes it a lot harder to, to work on things. So communication is key, um, especially during times like this where we're not face-to-face -face and we're not um, talking at the same time and really having that, that conversation back and forth. But I wanna record this for you so that you can watch it at your leisure you're not set in to a specific time or a specific date and that if there's a question you can go back to it and find the information you're looking for so let's dive into chapter 16 as i said um, page 363. Um, we've talked last week we talked about the paper claim the electronic claim now we're on to what happens once you've submitted the claim and you start getting money back you're receiving payments and what happens if there's a problem? Maybe you're not paid what you were supposed to be paid, or maybe they rejected your claim because there's an error with it and they need, um, or they need further information. So that's what it's really gonna talk about. <clears throat> so you're gonna assess what you get back. And excuse me, and those are typically called remittance advices. Um, if they're electronic, it's an ERA, electronic remittance advice. If it's not, you may get a paper one and it'll tell you what was paid, what wasn't paid. Um, hopefully it'll give you reasons why and, and that sort of thing. So um, talks about insured patients, contracts and fee schedules and reimbursement timeframes on that page 363. And then it goes into an explanation of benefits. Now, I don't know if any of you receive those, but I do. Um, if if um, I go to the dentist and have something done with my teeth, they bill my dental insurance and my dental insurance sends us what's called an explanation of benefits. I receive that and it explains we've paid the dentist this amount and based on your plan, whether there's a deductible or not a deductible or whether there's um, something else going on or whether they covered something or didn't cover something, they tell you what your portion is that you're going to be expected to pay that they expect the office to bill you for. That's an explanation of benefits. And that's on the top of, <clears throat> excuse me, page 364. And it also goes into remittance advice. And then it talks about how a suspended claim is essentially put into a pending um, category because there's some kind of errors and need for additional information. They can't process it. So they put it sort of in a electronic parking lot, so to speak. It's set there, it's pending, it's, it's suspended until they get what they need to move it forward. So it goes over the comp components of an explanation of benefits. This is on page 364. Um, and how you can interpret that, um, when they post it, um, 
and then they talk about secondary insurance. You know, we, we did that when we talked through the different types of insurance. And when we were running through, okay, if we build Medicare first and we may build Medicaid second, who pays and how much do they pay and all of that. So it gets into a little bit with that as to how that goes. Um, that brings us up to page 366. Um, and it gives you an example of patient portal where you can go in and see your insurance information. And if you haven't done that online with your current in insurance information, you may wanna do that just, just to find out what it looks like and how it works and what information you can find on there about yourself or your current claims. So then it goes on to claims management techniques. This is how do you process them? What do you do? Um, where do you know where to start? A good place to start is looking at aging reports. Aging reports list the oldest stuff that either hasn't billed or hasn't been paid and starting to look at those claims and work your way backwards. That's usually what's done. Um, you can put in inquiries, um, you can follow up on those problem claims, which you definitely want to do because sometimes there's time frames, deadlines on those as to how quickly you have to get those done. And if you don't get those done, you lose your ability to get paid or to be paid the full amount. I mean, there's all sorts of little itty bitty um, caveats in there that you really need to be aware of. So um, working sometimes on a daily basis, you have to work your cues that have pending claims, suspended claims, things that haven't been paid or haven't been paid in full or that have errors or need additional information. That's just something you have to do. So types of problems, we're on page 368. It gives you the different types of problems and then it gives you solutions. And so I'm gonna let you read through there, delinquent pending or suspense versus lost versus rejected versus denied um, versus downcoding. What happens when they make a payment to the patient? What happens when you're underpaid? What happens when you're overpaid? That takes us to page 373. We're gonna talk about rebilling. Rebilling is when you realize that there's something wrong and you're going to have to fix it and you're going to have to rebuild it. Whether they found an additional code, whether they removed a code, um, added a modifier, took off a modifier, um, whether you um, put on different corrected dates of service or provider number or something like that, you rebuild it. Now, you want to be really careful about rebilling. You want to rebuild if you find a genuine error that needs to be corrected. But you want to be careful that if you go back and let's say that you could have been paid more money for um, a particular procedure but because of the way it was coded it it will it it's not that it was incorrect but a better code to describe it that showed the complexity of it pays more you may want to go back and rebuild those claims but before you do you need to sit down and think about who is the payer <coughs> How many are you talking about? What kind of money are you talking about? And how is this all gonna work? Because you wanna be careful that you don't just rebuild every little thing, every little time. Um, if you do that, it's gonna raise a red flag with the carrier and they're gonna to start to say, why, why is this group rebilling for all of these things? And so you just wanna be careful and think things through and not just react. You wanna really have a policy in place um, have good understanding of what to do, when to do, how to do it, who to have involved, who, when do you let legal counsel know, um, keep a paper trail as to why re you're rebilling and what you're rebilling because you want to be able to show that you're consistent, um, that you're not just willy-nilly um, rebilling things for the sake of rebilling them. And then it goes into, on page 374, review and appeal process, and talks about how you file an appeal and you fight your way through the different levels of redetermination, um, and all the way up till you get to, oh, federal district court. Now, I've never gone that far. In my past experience, the most I've ever had to do was administrative law judge hearing, which was level three. A, the ALJ and we had several cases that came before the ALJ some ruled in our favor some didn't and we chose to let them go after we hit that level but some people want to take it to the very end and they have that right and they have those processes on the bottom of page 377 it starts talking about Medigap and their forms and how that works TRICARE um, because of course it's different for every payer <laughs> 
So it's one of those things you learn on the job as you're doing it, and then you figure it out from there. And then it, at the on page 383, it talks about the state insurance commissioner and what are the commission objectives and what, what kinds of problems get, in, get reported to the insurance commissioner for the state and how they go about their inquiries. So um, that's all in there. Then claim denial management starts on page 384 and that starts moving on. Um, talks about review and appeal, categorize, measure, strategize. At the bottom, excuse me, at the bottom of page 385, there's a really nice um, box called file and appeal and it talks about the way that you would follow, file an appeal. And that's got some good information in it. So be sure you review that. Page 386 has our key points for the chapter. So make sure you review those. Again, this is just to make sure that you understand the process, the steps that are involved and what would you do and what are some solutions to the problems that you might run into and how would you, um, how would you do that? So that's really what this chapter is about. What happens when the claim is processed? You, last, last week it was submitting the claim. This week is now, what do I do with the claim? And so that's what it goes through. Chapter 17, which we're going to go on to in a minute, and I'm going to put in a separate video so that it's not so long, um, talks about collection strategies. And that's really where you're, you've gotten the claim back and you've gotten paid for the piece that, that the insurance company will pay for. But now, how do you collect the rest, either from a secondary payer or from the patient or all those different types of things? So I'm going to end here and I will pick back up on the next video. See you in a bit.